Hello, welcome to Chess with Simon and Chewy. I'm Simon, this is Chewy. Chewy's back by popular demand. There's been a lot of complaints about his absence. Anyway, um, today we are going to look at creativity, beauty and surprise in a Grandmaster simultaneous display. And we're going to see who... Chewy's on the move, Chewy's on the move! Go on, there you go. We're going to see where the creativity and where the surprise and beauty comes from. So, this was a game played in a simultaneous with Mr. Grandmaster Peter Wells. Uh, it's always generous when Grandmasters make their time available for a simul. They're laying themselves open to the risk, uh, playing all these people at once. I don't know what she was doing back there, but he's doing things. They're, they're laying themselves uh, at risk, so it's kind of scary. But also, there is a little bit of arrogance, which is basically, I am going to play you 30, 40 people all at once. My brain takes on your 30 brains. You know, it's a fascinating, but it's also just a lovely event. You get to talk to each other. It's a bit more relaxed uh, than a normal chess match, where everyone has to be silent. You know, there's much less... Um, there's a bit less of a kind of festival atmosphere. Anyway... Uh, the picture above actually depicts what happened in the simul. So the person in the middle, sitting at the board, is Mr. Gareth Stevens. I don't know if you recognise the person on his, um, well, as we're looking at it, the right, but in reality the left, uh, as it was in the picture. I don't know if you recognise that person. But anyway, that's Mr. Gareth Stevens uh, at the end of this game. So um, I was sitting next to Gareth, and, you know, because I took it all terribly seriously, I was being very antisocial. I was focusing on my game, I played a character on defence, which was very dull, I managed to obtain a draw, I lost a pawn, I managed to stabilise myself, calm down a bit, I managed to uh, obtain a very boring draw, which I was terribly sort of pleased with. And I would have been pleased had it not been for the fact that the person next to me created a work of art, a thing of beauty. So let's just take a look at how the game went. So Peter is white and Gareth is black. So Peter plays pawn d4. This is Peter's standard move. Peter is a brilliant uh, tactical player, as is Gareth, actually. So it's the meeting of two very tactical players. Gareth plays knight f6, uh, perhaps heading for some kind of Indian defence, but even now there's time to transpose back into a, a Queen's Gambit decline. So actually it's not clear yet. Peter plays a standard move, pawn c4. Gareth plays e6, perhaps hinting at a Nimzo Indian or, or, or a Queen's Indian, although if you know Gareth, uh, you wouldn't be so sure of that, but certainly on the face of it, you'd think that, and I've fallen for this a number of times. Peter plays uh, knight c3, which you describe as the maximalist uh, move, basically uh, trying to prepare pawn e4, uh, but allowing the Nimzo Indian defence rather than the Queen's Indian. So I think this is, I would you'd say, the more ambitious move. And then Gareth just whips out pawn c5. Now, pawn c5 is definitely correct. This is heading towards uh, a Benoni defence, uh, which was played by Mikhail Tal, the great tactician. And I've got to say, there's something of the Mikhail Tal about Gareth. Uh, both of them are able to pull these combinations seemingly out of the thin air. They're sort of magicians. Uh, Tal was actually called the Wizard of Riga. And I think from now on, Gareth will be called the, uh, the Wizard of Cumna. Anyway, Gareth plays uh, pawn to c5. Peter plays the principled move, which is to advance. So now there's an exchange of pawns in the centre. So on the face of it, you say, well, this just benefits white because actually um, black's given up a centre pawn for white's wing pawn. White has two pawns in the centre. Like, what's black's big idea here? Black plays d6 just to stop that pawn advancing. White occupies the centre. Again, very principled. Black heads to Fianchetto, his king's bishop. So this is the Benoni proper. This is what you'd expect from the Benoni. Now, in a previous simul, Peter played uh, pawn f4 here, which is a lovely move, fascinating, leads to some amazing positions. Uh, and the sequence actually went bishop g7, bishop here check. Now the b knight went in the way. Now this is not generally thought to be correct. Certainly the engines don't really like this. Um, the b knight went in the way. You should really put the f knight in the way, so, it sh so you should put the other knight in the way. But uh, Peter pushed, which is correct, takes, takes. The knight moved away, and then white pushes again. So white's quite a lot better here. Black has a check. White pushes there. And now this is a very complicated uh, position, but it's not usually played by black at the elite levels. Actually, black won this, which is a great testament, great play. It's not usually played by black at the elite levels. Usually you, uh, you retreat the F knight. Anyway, Peter didn't do that today. Today he played a quieter move, pawn to h3. So... 
Black continues, free and Kettering the bishop, makes sense. Uh, knight f3, black castles. White again just defending that e pawn, and you can sort of see why. There's a, there's a, there's, you know, that e pawn, there's a chance it could become vulnerable. Black plays pawn a6. Now, this is a standard move in, in these Benoni positions. What black wants to do here is play pawn b5, and we'll see later that, um, that b5 uh, actually turns out to be quite important. But white's not going to allow that. So now white has played pawn a4 and is covering that b5 square three times. And it's only defended once. And what's more, uh, the a pawn is actually pinned against the rook. So black can't take back with the a6 pawn anyway because he'll lose a rook at the back. So at the moment, there's nothing doing for black. Uh, black plays knight bd7, which is the computer move. It's the engine move. Uh, this is a good move. You see a lot of this, bishop f4 in this position, so immediately that bishop's attacking the pawn on d6, and that pawn on d6 is a little bit vulnerable. It's currently not not defended. So Gareth defends it with the queen. I always worry about putting this queen on the open file, but actually this is an engine move. Uh, this is what Stockfish... This is one of the moves that Stockfish likes. There's nothing wrong with this move. White castles. So personally, I would prefer white here, as does the engines, but this is all still kind of known. This is all theory really. Black starts to diverge with uh, pawn h6. This creates possibilities of perhaps retreating the knight to uh, h7. White again defending that uh, e-pawn and also putting the rook opposite the queen never hurts. You know placing your rooks opposite queens is generally a good idea on, on an open file. And maybe that's why I personally don't particularly like queen e7 but, um, but still black's doing fine here. Black starts a dynamic play with sort of so knight h5 hitting that bishop. Bishop's got to move. Bishop backs up to uh, h7. And then dropping this knight into the e5 square. e5 square is very important. I mean, what the Benoni player has going for them is a half open e file and a pawn majority on the queen side and lots of dynamic chances. It's a big bag of tricks, really. Uh, it is sound. And I played in a Benoni correspondence tournament. Uh, on chess.com a while ago, and actually the black players did better than the white players. So it's sound, uh, it's a decent opening. I suppose it's just not an opening I'm completely comfortable in, but it, it's, uh, it's a fascinating opening. White uh, backs off the bishop just to defend that knight on f3. Um, again, that's an engine move, that's a really good move. Black's playing a bit of cat, cat and mouse here, backs off and decides to do something else, doesn't want the exchanges. Now white, this knight starts the journey, this is very common in the Benoni defence, the white knight starts the journey from d2 to c4, and then on that c4 square the knight will be very secure because there's no b5, uh, at least not now, and also because that knight on c4 is attacking the pawn on d6, it's quite hard to defend. So this is a, this is a standard uh, process. And also look, that knight on h5 is attacked, so now if I was black I'd be a little bit worried about this. So black retreats the knight on h5, white pops into c4 as predicted, again black's knight moves back looking for activity, looking for new ways to do interesting things. White plays pawn uh, a5, again this is a super move and it's one that's worth thinking about, so this is basically pinning down the black queen side. So what you're trying to stop here is pawn b5 because you're taking en passant. Um, so, and it sort of stops it forever as long as you can defend that pawn out on on a5 and currently it's defended by the rook and the knight and it's not attacked so currently it's great. Black uh, again is looking for uh, ideas, uh, the knight drops back into that important e5 square but it gives white this fork on b6 so that b6 square is a beauty. Uh, it's not a terribly important fork because the rook can just move uh, and uh, white could take that bishop. That light square bishop is very important in the king's indian it's perhaps a bit less important here because actually it doesn't really have any squares. Can't go to g4, can't go to f5, can't go to e6. It's actually almost a problem piece at the moment. Uh, so white doesn't bother to exchange it. Black just moves the rook. And then white's really going for it here. Pawn f4. Um, you know, this is sort of like, right, this has gone on for long enough. We're going to smash through the centre. We've got the rook opposite the queen. Black's looking a bit sort of retreated towards the back ranks. We're going to do this. And black retreats, offering an exchange of that knight on b6, and that's an exchange black would like to make. Uh, so white declines. Because if black takes on b6 and then white takes back with the pawn, you know, that's no good. That pawn's a bit vulnerable. You lose all of those advantages. Whereas now the knight's back on c4, 
you're still stopping b5 you're defending on on a5 you've got this uh space advantage it's a really good um it's a really good setup so white white's uh, looking good here and the engines agree with that and then Gareth just gets on with it and he just says, right, we're going to play B5 anyway. And I think this is a sensible move. And all Benoni players at some point just get on with it and play B5. White takes on Bassar. And Gareth here doesn't just sort of unthinkingly take back on B6. He throws in a check with the bishop, um, which is really uh, good and thoughtful and actually just starts to restrict the king's squares. And later on, we'll see how important this is. So this is actually laying the foundations for things that happen later. King runs, and then black snaps up this pawn uh, just a, a bit later than it used to. Now here, there's a good move for white. So the engines show that this is a really good positional move for white, knight a5, threatening to drop into that c6 square and cause a world of trouble. So black has to play bishop uh, d7, and then when white pushes, this is quite tough for black. But um, white played the push straight away, so this, I mean, the reason you play f4 is to allow yourself to push uh, e5. So this is very logical. This is uh, squeezing black space. I mean, this is a very interesting game of chess, you know, very dynamic, it's very complicated. There's lots of pieces in strange places. It's a really, but, but, but black isn't without ideas because the point is this is all creating holes in white's position that black's pieces can skip through later, which is a very typical kind of hypermodern idea. Anyway, Peter's going for it. If I was black here, I'd be scared. Gareth's not scared. He takes on c4, white takes back. Now he picks up this pawn on b2. And now black's got a bunch of dynamic counterplay. So now I think it's white who should be a little bit worried. I mean, so firstly, uh, the, the knight's not as secure as it was on c3 because it's not defended anymore. The rook's got an open file. Black's got an extra pawn. So black's got a pass pawn out on the a file. And you know, all of a sudden, black's just got a bunch of other ideas. It doesn't mean black's better. Actually, the engine says that white's still better. But black's got a lot of ideas, and he's got trumps, and he's got things to play for. White centralises that knight, perhaps thinking about, not straight away because it's covered, but thinking about the f6 square, thinking about taking on d6, just a really nice central knight, nothing wrong with it at all. It's also attacked by the bishop uh, on d4, so you can't leave it there, I'll get taken. Black retreats uh, the, the rook to b6, and there is a sort of cat and mouse element really to the way uh, Gareth's playing, but immediately this is defending the pawn on a6. So white uh, starts to manoeuvre this rook onto a different rank, perhaps with the idea of swinging it across. f5 is a good square, isn't it, for, for that bishop, and maybe just threatening to swap off that, uh, that knight whenever it's sort of convenient for black, really. And finally, that bishop's gotten developed. The knight retreats and attacks the bishop. So black defends with the knight on the basis that if white takes on f5, black takes back on f5. That's a really nice knight. The only way to get rid of it is to play g4 and create more holes in white's position. So actually, black would not mind white taking on f5, and it's certainly not what the uh, computers want to do. So Peter starts to go for exchanges. I think maybe Peter's getting a bit worried. I mean, that bishop wasn't doing much on c4 anyway. So he goes start to go for exchanges. Maybe he's a bit worried about black's active pieces and the way they're sort of jumping through the white position. Because the sort of smashing attack through the center isn't quite materializing. Gareth accepts a swap. Now putting that queen to control that, um, that open file, which has to be a good move. It's the engine's first choice, has to be a good move. The white knight jumps back into the centre, and now knight f6 is definitely um, definitely an idea. So Gareth exchanges two pawns here. Now, actually, I looked at this and I thought, oh, can't the queen take the pawn on d5? Now, uh, after a moment's reflection, we see that there's a check here, forking the queen and the king. But after another moment's reflection, actually, we can take that knight and then pick up the rook on a2. So actually... Queen takes d5 is is a correct move here. But if I were Gareth, I would totally understand the kind of caution of saying, hmm, it certainly uncorks a bunch of fireworks. You know, just setting yourself up for a um, for a fork like that feels very uncomfortable. Gareth played a really good positional move, knight f5. Um, again, overprotecting that d4 square. So if the bishop leaves, the knight can jump in. Uh, and that knight there is just really, just really good. It can do all sorts of things. 
Peter just says, right, I'm going to get on with this. We're going to push this pawn on. We're going to try and, you know, just maybe queen this pawn. It's a passed pawn, and passed pawns should be pushed, and it's protected on that square. But right now, the engine has black a little bit better because of black's sort of dynamic chances and the sort of holes in white's position. Gareth plays uh, king g7, meaning that when the knight moves to f6, if the knight moves to f6, it's not check anymore, which has got to be a good idea. And the knight then goes ahead and moves to f6. Now, this is a, a, the inspired move of a tactician, really, pawn c4. So this move uh, says we're gonna we're gonna hit the queen. We're gonna open up various squares that we can use. Um, it's a sort of a dynamic move, really. And the minute the queen moves, Gareth goes to the back and attacks that rook on e1, which is sort of pinned, if you like, to uh, the king. So straight away, if you look at it, the rook can't take on b1 because the queen will take back. Let's just do this variation, shall we? If the rook takes, the queen takes back. Hang on, I've got that wrong. The queen takes back. And then the only thing you can do is put the bishop in the way. So that's mating. So already, you're sort of thinking, this is quite tense, actually. The rook's attacked, the rook can't take. You know, it's a pretty sort of worrying situation. Peter brings his queen back to defend and then again Gareth this is the theme in Gareth's play he re retreats the rook to b3 uh, again it's this cat and mouse idea but actually there is um, there's a deeper concept here and at this point Peter and you can see the logic here he says right look there's a free pawn here I'm going to pick up that pawn um, there's no obvious threat and I'm also threatening to swap queens which will take the heat out of the position so I'm an extra pawn up I'm taking the heat out of the position what's not to like now, please feel free to pause the video or have a think or just feel what you think the right move is. But black has a move here which wins the game. And it is the sort of move that comes along once a decade. So it is a move of profound beauty and surprise. So just take 10 seconds. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? If you've, if you've paused the video, you can unpause the video. Rook takes on h3. This is a beauty. So thing one, um, white cannot take straight away because that pawn is pinned against the king. But thing two, we've got a threat. The threat is that the knight's going to come to g3 and it's checkmate when the knight comes to g3. So the point is, let's just say white takes the queen. So this is a queen sacrifice, technically. White takes the queen, which is hanging. Black has got knight g3. And that is a checkmate, because the bishop's pinned by the rook. This square's covered by the bishop. It's a very original checkmate. I mean, you won't, you've never seen this before in your life, this sort of idea. So the point is, the pawn on g2 is pinned by the queen, and the queen's going to get liquidated the next second by white's queen, but it's not quick enough, because there's a checkmate there, even though the queen has gone. So this move, it's an absolute shocker, and basically, white just has no move. I mean, if you try to find a move for white here, the bottom line is there's a checkmate on g3 with the knight how on earth do you get out of it can't move the bishop can't move the pawn uh, how do you cover the g3 square so what does the computer say the computer says rook a3 and if you play rook a3 okay you can play rook a3 the problem then is that black can chop off on a6 you can take on a6 and uh, and now white has a dilemma because then white can't take the queen back on a6 because then that renews the threat of black um, doing knight, knight g3 checkmate. So essentially what you're looking at is uh, the only way the computer can find to avoid the checkmate is basically to give up the queen. And Peter uh, very graciously chose to resign at that point, I think perhaps a bit tired uh, and you know it's just one of those things that happen. I mean when you're playing a simultaneous like that you can't check every variation but it was really a beautiful thing to see on the board these things live with you forever this is the nice thing about chess is I'll never forget that, Gareth will never forget that look at the picture, he's absolutely delighted quite rightly um, I had a good night too, played the Karakam defence but um, this certainly makes you want to play the Benoni and thank you to Peter for his time and thank you to Gareth for helping out with making the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you liked it, please like. If you want to see more, please subscribe. Uh, look after yourselves.